Dr. Trihan, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. Well, uh, you know, we are in your flagship hospital in the Delhi NCR region, one of the largest private hospitals in the country, 1,400 beds. Tell us a little more about this facility. So if you go in the background of why we created this, mm -hmm. such a large platform, was the whole idea that what was missing in India was institutions like Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, where they have a large platform where all the super specialists function on the same platform together as a team rather than individuals. So that's the structure of this place. So if you needed to accommodate this kind of services with the technology, with the safety of the patients, with the ease of doctors taking care of patients, ease of nurses. So if you look at the layout, it's always kept in mind that patient is the principal uh, recipient of the services. The doctors and the nurses and the paramedical are the second most important people who can function. And the third, of course, the families. That we have made these facilities so that the families can also uh, feel a part of the hospital treatment and stuff like that. So they are, if you see, we have made lounges for patients who are in ICU. Their families can stay over here. They don't have to go lie in the, in the, uh, lobby or anything like that. There are, there are like full facilities for them. So that was the reason why it is such a, it's 2.4 million square feet. And we have now like 30 super specialties working on the same plot platform led by the institution heads who are actually benchmarked around the world. Mm. So it, it creates that kind of uh, uh, sort of confidence in people and also the outcomes. Mm that because all the people are working together on the patients like it's, it's everybody's patient, mm. then these heads together can create magic. So I'll tell you, supposing somebody has heart. Mm. Heart problem can also have GI problem, bleeding GI, they have diabetes, they may have neurological problems from before. So if you have specialists of that variety working together as a team, then your outcome will be better than you would if you were working individually. Mm. Now that is the principle on which this was based. And I mean, like you, if you want to say, the proof is that today we can tackle over here situations where many, many people around the world would say, these people are inoperable or they, there's been any, nothing more treatment. So we actually have the confidence and we have proven it even in our records mm -hmm. that there is a so much benefit of creating this kind of platform that the outcomes in the most critical of patients is very favorable. So that brings me to actually medical tourism, medical value tourism, because somebody did point out that, you know, when you go to Medanta, mm -hmm. uh, their flagship hospital in Delhi, you'll actually feel like you've entered a hotel and uh, that's how fancy it is. But does it also, you know, the fact that you focus that much on super specialities, the amount of focus in terms of the softer aspects of the hospital as well, what is that doing when it comes to medical tourism well, or medical people, value travel? Yeah, so, so we have, before COVID, up to about 12% of our patients were international. Then COVID, of course, with the restriction of travel and COVID itself, lockdowns and all that, that went down to about 3-4%. Mm -hmm. Now it's on its way back up. So we, have, we are one of the favored destinations because of the fact that we are a seamless institution. Mm -hmm. From the moment they connect with us, we receive them at the airport, we bring them here, we treat them, we will then see them off at the airport. Mm. So we are, we are from that point of view, patients also find it very secure. Mm. See, one of the things, if you're coming to another country in an unknown city where, you know, there are so many vagaries uh, at play, that it gives them huge comfort that you can give them this kind of service. So it had fallen to around 4% of sales during COVID right. and uh, medical value tourism has probably risen to around 6%, 6 to 7% right. now. Right, no, maybe uh, it's a little more even now from the time as we are talking because it's, the recovery is much faster. And the biggest b bottleneck has been the visa. So the embassies are really, really now geared up mm -hmm. to because it was all disrupted. So now the pending visas are being issued. Mm -hmm. We have, as we speak today, over 140 visas waiting in Iraq to come. Okay. So, and uh, one, the other thing is that 
you know, the Prime Minister has announced these two schemes, no? Heal in India, Heal from, by India. And that also has triggered that all the services that participate, and you can take, you start from patients recognizing or talking to the doctor or recognizing which institution to go to, from that point to send them letters for the visa letters, from the visa to the airport, all those things are now being stitched together. So I think that India has a huge future for actually serving our countries, immediate countries and extended countries. But what is the USP that India has vis-a-vis -vis the other countries that are equally focused on medical value tourism? So there are three major things you can speak of. One is that we have sort of the highest level of care available here across all specialties. So, so that you can, you cannot, if you close your eyes and I took you to Cleveland Clinic today mm -hmm. and you opened your eyes there, you would not be, know the difference mm -hmm. where you are. Mm -hmm. So that is one part of it. Second is the fact that the cost is much less. Mm -hmm. So they're not paying for, uh, for cheap, med cheap services at cheap price. They are paying for a, a lesser price for very high-end services, which are comparable. And the third, the third important thing is that language is another situation that we are more universal in English than other countries because they, are, they have that impediment. So I think that they feel very comfortable. India has a good image, improving, I would say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, things like what is happening in Delhi with the pollution and all that doesn't help. Mm -hmm. So as we move forward and try to solve these problems, I think in, undoubtedly India will be the premier destination of all other competing nations. When do you expect it to probably rise back to its peak of 12%, maybe surpass it as well? I think that past Christmas, mm -hmm. you will see the whole surge. Okay, so you'll probably see it back to 12%. We are already 7 8% already. So you're seeing it like, as we speak every week, it will go up. And sustain at probably 15% or higher? Could be higher even. That's what we are aiming for. And why not? Because it's a, it, it is, you see, that also demonstrates the soft power of India. Mm. That, as you know, I was in the U.S. for 20 years. Mm. So, 17% of all super specialists were Indians in America, mm. right? Out of 350 million people. Mm. Today, it must be much more. If you look at NHS, 30% of the doctors who do the service are Indians. Mm. If you look at the nurses, they're all over the place. So the branding of India as a superior human capital is already established, right? Now the question is, how do we actually capitalize on that by improving our services and our environment? We do have, a, you know, a deficit when it comes to the doctor-patient ratio in India, the nurse-patient ratio in India. How do you think that we could probably bridge that gap? Because you are talking about how, and we've seen it ourselves, the US and uh, probably the UK have some of the best doctors who are of Indian origin. True. How do we get that brain drain back into India? So, you know, I am a believer that brain drain is just an investment overseas. Mm -hmm. And as facilities like this get established more and more, mm -hmm. They find it very convenient. Now, we, we have made a hospital in Lucknow. We have made it in Patna. So when we started here, people came from overseas. Mm. Doctors who were serving there at the highest level, they came back because they were always looking for a place to function mm. with this kind of facilities and this kind of ethos. Mm. So, so I think that as we move forward, more and more people will be attracted back. But that's not what we have to depend on. I mean, if you do look at it, 3,000 doctors go overseas every year out of the 80,000 that we, we actually graduate. Mm. What we need to do is to, from day one to starting the medical colleges, to the controlling the quality of the medical colleges, postgraduate training, increasing the number of seats available to these graduates to be able to become super specialists, mm. then super specialists. Mm. So we need to build that whole thing, which is happening as we speak. But it's a long process. Mm. It takes five years to get out of medical college and another five years to become a specialist. So we are talking about the seeds have been sown, but the reaping will be another few years from now. It's mm. not available immediately. You mentioned Cleveland Clinic a couple of times. Is that your inspiration? 
Yeah, yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Is that what you're planning to probably expand? Uh, you know, currently you're just focused a lot on North. You have a hospital which is coming up in Noida as well. Right. Uh, what about the rest of India? Well, we are not, we are agnostic, you can say, to any location. The principles that we go on are one, that we, as a DNA of, of ours, that we want to provide the highest end of care in areas where, which are suffering. So you take the choice of... But we are suffering across the board. 200, no, 200 million people in UP who did not have this kind of facility. So we created there. Bihar is the other one where 120 million people and no really facility to speak of. So we established there. Noida is a is a sea. If you if you go to Noida, you the population doesn't end. Mm. Right? It just goes on and on and on. It's, it's almost reaching merit. Mm. But there are no facilities of this variety. So that's why we were building there. Now, if you look at it, the chain mm. from Patna, which is basically in the east, mm. east, then UP, mm. then Gurugram, mm. Noida coming up, there will be some other which are in plans, which we will we will let everybody know in the near future. And then this story will go on. So we cut across through the heartland of India. We are serving over 400 million people. So this footprint is, is very, because we are also, so if you look at it, I said, people who need it, the standard should not be diluted. Where do prices stand? How much do you have in terms of the ability to raise prices? So by principle, we are, do not want to be the most expensive in the market, no matter how high our facilities are. Mm. We want to make it as re reasonable as possible, mm. keeping in mind that as many people can who can access this kind of treatment mm. should benefit. Mm. It should not be for the elite. Mm. So there is, so we, if you look at our mix, we have all people, the highest people you can talk about in your you know, hierarchy. I don't consider them high or low. But I'm saying that at all economic strata, all educational strata, government, all that stuff, we are agnostic. We want to give the same treatment to everybody because human life is the same, no matter what, where you come from. So we try to keep it as affordable, keeping in mind that you need a certain margin to be able to, one, renew yourself, which is very important because technology is the backbone and technology gets obsolete within seven years. This whole 20, 25 crore machines, yeah. the company says it's end of life. I mean, these are bizarre things that, that have happened, but we are in the clutches of international uh, manufacturers. Of course, with this Atma Nirbhar, things are improving. Yeah. We will, in times to come, produce our own MRIs and uh, high-end scans and stuff like that, which we don't today. Yeah. So we are totally dependent on these companies from around. And they can dictate, they said after 10 years, although the, the machine can be extended to longer, much longer, maybe 15 years, 20 years, some of the machines. But they refuse to give parts. They say, well, now we don't manufacture parts anymore. Mm. So you have no choice. Mm. So I'm saying that you have to keep it in mind that the pricing has to give enough that you can renew yourself, mm. you can pay back your debts, mm. and also leave enough margin for growth. So keep putting this together, I think that around 20 to 25 percent is the ideal margin which you should have yes. in healthcare because it's like I always say it's a it's it's not a business it's a business with a soul yeah. it doesn't have it's not cold blooded in any way it should never be so for us medicine first because I have said it many times that good medicine will give you good returns but good good business will not give you. Mm. So that's that's the whole. So will the margins probably sustain at 20%? You've done 20% in the previous quarter. Is yeah, that, we're doing 22, is that the target? No, I mean, if it goes up 2, 3, 4%, which is not bad, which is good. It only gives us enough elbow room to create more. But you don't want to cut corners. Mm. You never want to compromise the quality of treatment. You do not, and like you, like I said, you don't want to deny people. Because, you know, people who are already on the sidelines, mm. okay, they deserve medicine as much as anybody does. So you try to make it possible in whatever way, how. Now you see, 
the government has also taken that view with Ayushman coming in. There is a the relief. There's a safety net for 50 crore people. And now the government is also talking about increasing that net. And which how it should be. People who can afford should buy private insurance. Mm. People who can't afford should be given this kind of safety net, which the government has done. So has healthcare changed uh, post-COVID-19 because there's more awareness? People are walking into the hospitals more simply because there is more insurance penetration, which has taken place as well. And like you mentioned, there is some amount of cap catch up in terms of infrastructure. So, you know, psych psychologically, psychologically, if you look at it, it became very clear to people that people who had comorbidities mm. and got COVID, especially mm. in the Delta wave, mm. they were the ones who were really vulnerable to losing their life. Mm. The healthier ones, no matter what their age was, mm. they were the ones who survived the best. So what does that do? It shakes you up to say, okay, one, I want to invest in health. The other, I want to invest in my protection. Yeah. So that is why the more and more people will seek that. Yeah. And so that's a very good thing to say that if we have healthier India, yeah. I mean, we will be no question on top of the world. Yeah. Because of the fact, simple fact, that we are more suited yeah than any other country, like I told you before, to be able to offer these services. Mm. I believe, and this is my belief, you agree or don't agree, that God gave us the best brains in the world. Mm. Indians do have the best brains. Mm. But we don't have that discipline yet. Mm. Mm. If we can combine the two, why do Indians perform beyond mm. anybody in the, when they go overseas? Mm. Because they have the brains, they have the intelligence. We have the innovative spirit in, uh, you know, like we call Jugaad. Mm -hmm. We can do many of those things because we, this is survival in India. Mm -hmm. Now, the next thing is that the environment there is so well organized mm -hmm. that there are the systems are so robust that people function very nicely in there. Now, that's, that's Medanta, mm -hmm. that we have created those protocols, those mm -hmm. systems because we don't have visiting doctors. Yeah. We have full-time doctors. Mm -hmm. Everybody is here. Mm -hmm. They have staked their profession, their life, everything in one place. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference between having a thousand visiting people who will fill up the beds, but then the standard will not be there and there is no, no sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. So if you have a sense of belonging, as you go forward, mm -hmm. you will see more and more people will come into the loop and actually want to stay and stake their whole career here. Dr. Trihan, you're now a listed company. So let me ask you, what might your two to three year vision be? So look, we have reached, and that's why we did the IPO, mm -hmm. is to we have reached a stage in the life of this company mm -hmm. where it has been well recognized mm -hmm that the standard that we created, because when, when I, we first started this, people wondered whether this kind of hospital will even work. Mm -hmm. But it speaks for itself because from here we have created five other hospitals. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we have reached a stage in our life where we can actually take the standard, which are now very robust. The protocols are all set mm -hmm. that we can do it much more uh, I say rapidly than we would have otherwise if we just did organic, organic, organic. Yeah. So that way it is, it gives you that flexibility, one, to serve more and more people, yeah. right? And also investors got their exit, which is also the second most important thing that everybody should feel that they have, we have recognized their participation and they can actually, uh, uh, you know, go on to the next, because that's what, the financial institutions do. So that's the freedom to everybody. Uh, I didn't sell. We don't want to sell. We just want to keep. Would you look to probably sell some stake later? No, I have, I have a belief that we should, we've got a very good thing going. We should build on it, build on it, build on it. And my, I'm a doctor, so my satisfaction doesn't come from money. <laughs> Truly. It comes from quality of healthcare. No, I'm also sure. our patients. Mm -hmm. You know, you will not believe that your blessings, mm -hmm. your success, mm -hmm. 
everything comes from three simple facts. One, when a patient comes to you, he should have the confidence that you're going to give him the best treatment available in the world that he deserves, right? That you have the knowledge to do it and you will sincerely do it. Uh, preventive healthcare, that seems to be a big emerging uh, segment. Is that the case? Um, okay, so very good question because yeah. we became doctors to treat disease. Yeah. Then we said we are smarter than that. Yeah. Why not early detection so they don't get so sick and their outcomes will be better. Then we said, why let people get sick? Yeah. Then with the soul wellness, preventive started. Okay. Yeah. But now we have gone beyond that. Yeah. Now we are saying predictive health. Medanta is leading the way in that, by the way. Yeah. That we are saying now there is enough knowledge, enough technology, yeah. enough algorithm that we can create today with the help of knowledge and, and technology yeah. to predict to a great degree on some of the diseases like, like uh, heart disease, yeah like uh, diabetes, even some cancers. Yeah. So uh, when a per person comes to you with, say, a history, a family history of heart disease, yeah. now should he live in fear all his life? Yeah. What are the things we write because from our, yeah. from our wellness program, from our preventive, uh, but we go beyond that. Yeah. You can see, predict with their genetic makeup, yeah. their biomolecular makeup now to say, what are your chances? So you can be much more precise than you were before. Yeah. Diabetes, you know, you can prevent diabetes because we, we have the knowledge today to say, yes, these are the parameters you need to look at. This is the algorithm for an individual. So what you're saying is, is personalized medicine. Yeah. And in that medicine, you can say, look, you have absolutely 25% chance of developing diabetes if you're not careful from today onwards. Now that person stays warned. Mm. If I tell the whole world, don't eat sugar, don't eat this, you may get diabetes, nobody's going to listen. And that's what's happening. You think that after all, we have gone blue in the face talking about what are the bad parts about fat, what about meats, what about this, what about that, junk food. Mm. You look at the look at the success of junk food companies. Mm. It's, only, it's going through the roof. All right, Dr. Trihan, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Victor. Thank you. And Enjoyed uh, taking it, my some time. Thank you.